And then I love what she said to me. She said, if, if someone wants to be the teacher of the year, the pharmacist of the year, the optometrist, the optician of the year, she said, every, the husband or wife of the year, the parent of the year, she said, every year just have one thing you're working on being fundamentally better at. And I'd ask you right now, what do you want to be fundamentally better at at your job? What do you want to be fundamentally better at as a parent, as a spouse? You know, I don't know if any of you play a musical instrument. Uh, I, uh, I always wanted to learn to play a musical instrument, and so, uh, uh, I, but I always, I tried guitar a couple of times, but I, I had a fatal flaw. I never practiced. Any of you ever do that? You know, you go to the lessons, and I'd come back the next week, and the instructor would say, well, you haven't improved at all. Well, did you practice? Well, no. And, uh, and honestly, the reason is because I'm an extrovert. I don't know about any of you in the room. I'm kind of an extrovert. I don't really like sitting around practicing by myself. So a friend of mine said, after all these years, said, John, you should take up the African drum. He said, because it's an extrovert's instrument. You know, you don't, uh, you don't uh, kind of play by yourself. You don't even have to learn to read music. You just got to kind of feel it in your bones, right? And, and then, of course, another friend said, well, of course, you know what they call uh, people who like to hang out with musicians, don't you? And I said, what? He said, drummers. But anyway, uh, and so anyway, so uh, I sign up in the hippie district uh, uh, of my city. I sign up for a, a weekly drumming class, right, on Saturday afternoons, right? And I show up the first night, and, and there's me and about 25 hippies from 17 to 75, tie-dyed, dreadlocked, and Birkenstocked. Of course, I told my best friend, that story, and he said, well, they had a different story. They said, honey, how was the class? He said, well, it was 25 normal people and one button-down stiff guy, but anyway. <laughs> and I learned two things in that class. The first thing I learned is that it's not as easy as it looks to learn to play the African drum, the djembe. The second thing I learned is after a couple of weeks, the class naturally divided. On the right side sat the good drummers. <laughs> And on the left seat, just by osmosis, sat the bad drummers. And I'm over here with the bad drummers. And as the weeks go by, I'm getting worse and worse. They're getting better and better. The teacher, after a few weeks, gives up on, the, on this side of the room. He pretty much only gives feedback over here. Every once in a while, he just says to us, will you guys stop for a while so these guys can? And after about uh, six or eight weeks of this, I came to a very important, simple, but profound conclusion. I was never going to get any better sitting with the bad drummers. So the next week, I come over and I sit between two of the best drummers. They give me this strange look, like, what are you doing on this side? You have not graduated to the good drummer side. <laughs> but there's no rules, so I'm sitting there with the good drummers. A funny thing begins to happen. First of all, I look to my right, somebody's doing it really well. I look to my left, somebody's doing it really well. The second thing is on the break, the good drummers start to say, you know, I can see you're really trying. Can I show you what you're doing? I mean, I've been watching you, I know what you're doing. The teacher suddenly can't ignore me anymore because I'm messing up the good drummers now, right? <laughs> So he'll say, John, John, just wait a minute, let me show you. And he said, halfway through, like one of the classes, he says, John, you know, he said, I got to tell you, you remind me of me. He said, all through music school, I was always like the guy who couldn't get it. He said, but I would stay and I would practice and I would practice. He said, good for you, keep it up. And the interesting thing is I started asking for feedback. I started saying, Russell, I know I'm, that's the teacher, I know I'm doing it wrong. I'd say to the good drummers, look, Bob, I know I'm doing it wrong. What am I doing? And if you want to make a commitment to grow, let me challenge you to ask people how you're doing. Ask your colleagues, especially the ones who are the really good drummers. What do you notice about how I am with patients? What do you notice about the way I am in terms of how I treat colleagues? What do you notice about the way I'm showing up at work that I could improve? Start asking your kids if you've got teenagers. How many of you have children, by the way? Yeah? How many of you were children at some time in your life, yeah? You know, I have teenagers. You know the wonderful thing about teenagers? By the time they're teenagers, they know what you need to do to be a better parent. But when's the last time you sat down with them and said, give it to me, no holds barred. What do I need to do to be a better parent? I did that with my kids when, uh, when all three were teenagers. One's 23 now, and... Uh, and I asked them, I sat down, said, I want to know what do I need to do to be a better dad. And I'm, because I travel a lot, I expected them to say, you know, Dad, we want you to travel less, be home more. You know what they said? They said, look, we respect your work. We've all seen you speak. We admire what you do. We know you make a difference in people's lives. You're not home as much as many dads. But here's the deal. When you're home, we want you to really be home. 
We don't want you to be checking voicemails. We don't want to be emailing. We don't want you to ask us how our day was and then not listen. We want you to really be here. And I give you some great advice. When someone gives you feedback at work, in your life, your husband, your wife, your kids, there's only two appropriate responses when someone gives you feedback. Here's those two responses. Thank you. Tell me more. You know, you're a little abrupt with the patients sometimes, with the customers. Thank you. Tell me more. You know, sometimes, even though you're a great colleague, you come in and when you've had a bad day, you kind of take it out on us. Thank you. Tell me more. Honey, I wish you would stop driving that way. Thank you. Tell me more. <laughs> It's not always easy. <laughs> My wife and I do that now. I go, thank you, tell me more, and then she shuts up. So it's just kind of a little game we have. <laughs> thank you, tell me more. But when's the last time you asked for that heartfelt feedback? And when you go and you get that performance review, those of you who get a performance review, instead of going in and thinking, oh man, I gotta sit through this again, ask more questions. If they give you a great review, say, that's great, I'm glad I'm a star, I'm glad I'm doing well, but what do I need to improve? What would make me even better? Because like that teacher, Helen O'Donnell, the path to greatness, whether it's in our personal lives or in our work lives, is that we never stop growing. We make that commitment to continue to grow, to continue to learn. 